From the earliest days of flight, pilots could see the potential of aircraft as a vehicle for munitions. In 1910, Louis Poyon flew the aeroplane that carried Lieutenant Paul Beck of the United States Army, who carried out the world's first bombing tests. A few months later, Glenn Curtis demonstrated aerial bombing to a crowd of military personnel. The following year, Philip Parmalee thrilled crowds by dropping a bomb on a shed during a flying exhibition. But early aeroplanes were fragile constructions made from wood and fabric, not designed to carry armaments such as bombs. It wasn't until the Rumpelachtaube rolled off the German production line that aeroplanes went into combat. On November the 1st, 1911, Italian Army Lieutenant Guilio Gavotti made history when he dropped four four-and-a-half-pound Cipelli grenades over Turkish positions, pulling the pins out with his teeth before tossing them over the side. The Germans used Taubas at the outset of World War I to drop three-kilo bomblets over Paris in 1914. But the aircraft was soon outmoded and went on to be used as a training aeroplane. A new breed of bombers took to the sky. The Voison 3 was the most notable, a sturdy steel machine developed by a French designer. Both the French and the Imperial Russian Air Forces used this pusher biplane. The Avro 504 was produced in Britain. Four of the biplanes made a successful raid on Germany's Zeppelin airbase at Lake Constance, delivering four 20-pound bombs each. While there were some skeptics who failed to recognize the potential of the aeroplane as a weapon of war, it didn't take long for flying machines to establish themselves as a vital part of military strategy in World War I. Balloons were also used by both sides for observation and home defense. As well as bombers and fighter airplanes, the Germans continued to produce Zeppelin airships. The giant, steerable balloons had a greater bomb-carrying capacity and could travel further than conventional aircraft. In 1915, the Kaiser approved Zeppelin attacks against Britain as long as historic monuments were not targeted. On January the 19th, the first people to die in bombing attacks were killed in Zeppelin air raids targeting English regional centers. A further 19 raids killed 181 people and forced the British to bolster their air defenses. In June 1915, R.A.J. Warnford earned the Victoria Cross for being the first person to bring down a German airship. He did so by dropping nine six-kilogram bombs on the Zeppelin. As the war drew on, newer aeroplanes proved more effective at downing airships, leading the German military to lose confidence in them. Gotha Wagonfabrik designed twin-engined bombers that carried a deadly payload over the channel, resulting in hundreds of civilian deaths. The British produced their own long-range bomber, the Handley Page Type O. When the Royal Naval Air Service commissioned the aircraft, it demanded, quote, a bloody paralyzer of an airplane, unquote. And that's exactly what it got. This monster of the air could carry a 2,000-pound bomb load, fly 95 miles per hour, and had a six-hour endurance. It measured 100 feet from wingtip to wingtip. The remarkable aircraft was powered by two 250-horsepower Rolls-Royce engines and included armored fuel tanks. The crew entered the cockpit through a trapdoor in the floor of the fuselage. The bombs were carried inside the Handley Page, suspended by their noses, and selected and released by an electrical current. Bombs could be dropped in fours or singly, their weight forcing them through a door built into the base of the bomb cell that closed behind them. The British sent the Handley Page to the Western Front and the Middle East, where it bombed submarine bases, warships, rail yards and factories. Of all the HP bombers flown in the First World War, only one was lost to enemy fire, and it took three enemy fighters with it. It was one loss too many for air command, however, and the bomber was confined to night bombings for the remainder of the war. 
At war's end, the aeroplane had well and truly proved itself as a weapon of war. But not everyone was convinced. Billy Mitchell, the assistant chief of the US Army service, who was pushing for a greater slice of the defense pie, boasted that his aircraft could sink a battleship. Few military chiefs believed this was possible. In February 1921, Mitchell was allowed to use decommissioned American warships and captured German battleships to prove his point. Billy Mitchell, a prophet before his time, believed bomb-carrying planes could sink naval ships. In 1921, he arranged an amazing demonstration of air power. Army planes dumped their bombs on obsolete battleships. Mortally wounded, one of the ships slid out of sight. The first naval vessel sunk from the air. The others followed soon after. Billy Mitchell was right. Mitchell's aeroplanes sank all six vessels and cemented the role of bombers in world warfare. The success of the bombing display woke the US Navy to the potential of aircraft. It established a naval aviation division that to this day remains separate from the US Air Force. In 1924, Mitchell wrote a prophetic report, warning his superiors not to underestimate Japanese air power in the Pacific, but was ignored. His constant criticism of America's lack of investment in military aviation made him many enemies, and he was transferred to the boondocks and eventually court-martialed. The Curtis B-2 Condor was a descendant of the Martin Knight bomber short-range aircraft developed late in the First World War. Commissioned by the United States Army Air Corps, the Condor was a large fabric-covered biplane with steel rather than wood tubing used in the construction of its fuselage. Unusually for the time, a gunner position was built into the rear of the cockpit as well as the nose and fitted with a pair of Lewis machine guns. By the early 30s, the Condor was obsolete and the US was making rapid strides in aeroplane development. 1931 saw the production of the first all-metal monoplane bomber, the Boeing Y-1B-9, closely followed by the Martin B-10. Across the Atlantic, the RAF commissioned a number of prototype military aircraft, including the Hawker Hart Day Bomber. With its distinctive pointed nose and sleek, streamlined body, the Hart became the most popular light bomber of its day. Thanks to its powerful Rolls-Royce Kestrel 12-cylinder, 525-horsepower engine, the bomber had a top speed of 184 miles per hour, faster than a fighter. The Hart had a range of more than 400 miles and could carry 520 pounds of bombs. The bomber was widely used in the interwar period across the British Empire, seeing service in Egypt, Africa, India and Abyssinia. It was finally superseded by the bombers of World War II. As the loser of the First World War, Germany was stripped of resources and forbidden to rearm. But in 1924, Germany joined with the USSR and secretly opened a military pilot training school. In 1935, the Nazi leader Adolf Hitler openly established the Luftwaffe and the Air Force's pilots and aircraft made their mark in the Spanish Civil War. The Luftwaffe was used to good effect in 1939 when it opened up hostilities in Europe. Leading the fleet was the Heinkel HE-111, an aircraft designed in the early 1930s in violation of the Treaty of Versailles. The medium bomber played important roles in the Battle of Britain, the Eastern and Western Fronts, the Mediterranean and North Africa. The Junkers Ju-87 and the Dornier Do-17 carried out successful bombing raids and helped the Luftwaffe become Europe's premier air force. When British anti-aircraft guns and fighter planes shot down HE-111 in the early months of the war, there was great rejoicing, but the joy was short-lived. In this dramatic reconstruction, we tell the story of a German Heinkel bomber. Britain's air defenses went into action. Our fighter planes gave chase. There was a dogfight in the sky. 
With fierce fire from our anti-aircraft and fighters, the German machine was crippled, gradually forced lower and lower. It fled out across the moors. And now, here lies a German raider, riddled with British bullets. Those bullets killed the two German gunners and wounded the pilot. But all the same, he did a fine job, zigzagging to try and shake off his pursuers, and finally pancaking down in the heather without destroying his machine. This is the latest type of German long-range bomber. According to their propaganda, it was faster than any in the world. It was absolutely unbeatable in the air. Yet here it lies, a tribute to Britain's air defences. In April 1940, Germany swept into Denmark and Norway on its way to establishing a presence on the Atlantic coast. Under the command of Lieutenant General Hans Ferdinand Geisler, hundreds of Luftwaffe aircraft bombed towns and military installations. The Scandinavians were swiftly crushed. Luftwaffe bombers also savaged the British home fleet, preventing an Allied counter-attack. Holland and France were the next to fall, providing Germany with the perfect staging point for air attacks on Britain. Nazi planes, now only a few minutes' flight from the English coast, set out to bomb the British people into submission. Britain hung on. They bombed railroads and factories to disrupt transportation and war production. They bombed by day, and when the Royal Air Force smashed more than 180 of the bombers out of the sky in one session, they bombed by night. The face of London changed. The Germans used the Junkers Ju-87 to spearhead the Blitzkrieg on Britain, a dive bomber that had caused havoc during the battle for France. This two-seater ground attack aircraft dived low towards its target before releasing its payload with pinpoint accuracy. But although the Junkers was the best bomber at the Germans' disposal, it proved no match for England's fighter planes. Strike at the railroad. For then the victim cannot mobilize. It cannot move men in supplies. Its armies are isolated. sophisticated radar defense gave the English early warning of the German raids and squadrons of hurricanes and Spitfires scrambled into the air ready to make mincemeat of the German bombers. It wasn't long before the Junkers were hastily pulled from service as German losses mounted up. Instead, the HE-111 and DO-17 rumbled through Britain's airspace delivering bombs day and night in an attempt to undermine civilian morale. In 1941, Hitler sent his troops east to invade the Soviet Union. Reconnaissance aircraft pinpointed bombing targets, including ammunition dumps and airfields. The Luftwaffe's mission was to destroy the Red Army's air fleet on the ground. The Soviets were so unprepared for an air attack that their aeroplanes were clustered on the ground in peacetime configurations rather than dispersed. They made easy picking for German bombers who accounted for thousands of Soviet aircraft. This gave Germany air superiority until 1943 when the Soviets began to hit back in newly designed fighters and bombers.
In the early years of the war, the British Fairy Swordfish torpedo bomber achieved surprising success. The outmoded biplane, known as the string bag for its ability to carry any type of cargo, was made from metal and fabric and featured folding wings for use on aircraft carriers. In November 1940, the Swordfish played a pivotal role in the Battle of Taranto, the first all-aircraft naval attack in history. Using modified torpedoes dropped from a low height, the British inflicted heavy damage on the Italian fleet. The following year, Swordfish pilot Sub-Lieutenant John Moffat launched the torpedo that jammed the Bismarck's rudder and steering gear and enabled British destroyers to sink the great German warship. With swift decision, the RAF replied to the Nazi raid on the Orkneys when the first civilian was killed on British soil. A large number of RAF bombers set out for the fortified German island of Silt and bombarded seaplane bases, ammunition dumps and harbours up and down the island continuously for six hours. List, of which this is an aerial photo, had its share, as well as the Hindenburg Dam. Britain has shown her determination to answer Nazi raids in a language the Bosch will understand. Just before the war, the RAF commissioned 250 Hudson light bombers from the American Lockheed Corporation. Adapted from the Model 10 Electra civil airliner, the Hudson sported Lockheed's distinctive twin tail configuration and featured a transparent nose to help the bomb aimer. These V-14 bombers, better known as the Lockheed Hudson bombers, are rolling off the production line at an ever-increasing rate. They have been ordered in great quantities by Great Britain and Australia. When ready for delivery by boat, the Hudson bombers are dismantled. The sleek fuselages are carefully encased in canvas, and the wings, already stowed away below deck, are crated in wooden frames for safe shipment. When the planes reach their destination, they are easily reassembled and soon ready to take their places in the staunch defense of the British Empire. And while these planes start on their long journey by water, others are being given their final test flights for the tough job ahead. And still more are winging their way directly toward Canada. The mid-wing monoplane was capable of carrying 1,400 pounds of bombs and had two fixed .303 machine guns mounted for defense in both the nose and the tail. In 1940, airborne surface vessel radar sets were installed in a number of Hudsons, which were then assigned to submarine duty. Operating from Northern Ireland and Iceland, the bombers carried out many successful strikes on the U-boats that lurked in the North Atlantic, including U-570, which was salvaged and converted to service for the British. Thousands of Hudsons rolled off the Lockheed production line during the three years they were manufactured. The pilots entrusted with delivering them to Britain included record breaker Jacqueline Cochrane. The first female pilot to ferry a bomber across the Atlantic, Cochrane was appointed a wing commander in the British Auxiliary Transport Service. She later helped found the US Women Air Force Service Pilots, which trained a thousand women pilots to ferry military aircraft around the country. Miss Jacqueline Cochran, first woman to pilot a Hudson bomber across the Atlantic to Britain, is a welcome visitor at one of our fighter stations. The attractive young American wishes happy landings to a number of pilots, setting out on an aerial sweep over enemy-occupied territory. Amid fighter aircraft and surrounded by the people she is helping by ferrying planes to them from America, we bring Miss Cochran to the microphone to say a few words. The greatest thrill of my life was acting as first officer in the bomber which I brought from America to Great Britain. I've been flying for nine years, and it's always been as a sporting event with me and for my own entertainment. For once, I've done something that I feel is a contribution to a cause that I'm in sympathy with, with Great Britain. I hope I may be privileged to do a great deal more. Today I have seen the most magnificent thing that I ever hope to see, a very large group of women, the Women's Auxiliary Air Force. And they are doing a job in the most diversified work that I've ever seen done by women. They're relieving hundreds of men, really doing a man's job, each and every one, and to help their country. And I wish it were possible that I could stay here and help them. 
But maybe in America I can do enough to make up for what I can't do here. More than 2,500 Hudson bombers were built during the war, and they served with air forces in Australia, Brazil, Canada, and New Zealand. However, they became outmoded as the war went on and started to be pulled from service in 1944. Whenever you pick up your paper or listen in to the news bulletins and you read or hear those familiar words, the Air Ministry have issued the following communique. Bear these pictures in mind. Bogged down in the Eastern Front, the German war machine came under increasing pressure from RAF Bomber Command's Precision Strategic Bombing Campaign. The British put the Handley Page Halifax to work. The four-engine heavy bomber produced by English Electric carried 13,000 pounds of bombs and entered service in November 1940. Halifax bombers flew almost 83,000 operations, dropping more than 220,000 bombs, many of them over Germany. The Avro Lancaster, a four-engined monster that became the most successful night bomber of the war, usually accompanied them. Lancasters carried the heaviest bombs ever made, and several were modified to transport Grand Slam earthquake bombs, which successfully penetrated the 30-foot thick ceilings, protecting the Hooge and Brest U-boat pens. From the outset of the war, it was clear to military planners that air campaigns were as critical as those fought thousands of feet below. The Allies clawed back ground in Europe, using bomber squadrons to deliver deadly payloads designed to cripple German infrastructure and undermine civilian morale. Before the sirens are wailing and the bombs dropping in Germany. The one thing that will bring Germany down, said Prime Minister Winston Churchill, is an absolutely devastating, exterminating attack by very heavy bombers from this country upon the Nazi homeland. After suffering heavy losses early in the war, Bomber Command transformed its day bomber force into night bombers that targeted vast areas of Germany's Ruhr industrial heartland. Following the fall of France in 1940, the RAF carried out daylight raids on the German invasion forces. World War II proved the military importance of air power. While aviation had played a minor role in 1918, supremacy in the skies was to become the key to Allied victory. Wave after wave of bombers roared across the channel, battling on their way the enemy aircraft that darted after them like deadly wasps. Rumbling on, the giant ships dropped their cargoes of devastation. Well, did you reach a target? Yes, and bombed. And you'll, you dropped two 250s and 1240s. That's right. Now, do you observe any results? Well, I myself didn't, but I believe my gunner did. And what did you see? Uh, one burst directly on the hangar, sir. Yes. And the 40s exploded across the aircraft, dispersed. How many aircraft were there? About seven, sir. About seven. Do you think you did any damage to them? Yes, sir. They burst right across. Oh, I see. Did you see any damage to them? Yes, sir. I gave them a burst as we went through. And you feel certain you hit them? Yes, sir. Definitely. And, uh, did you didn't see any actual flames or anything like that, but you feel quite sure that you did definite damage to the yes. three aircraft which were in the northwest corner of the drill. Now, I think that's all, gentlemen. Thank you much. Nothing else you can tell me. You didn't see anything on the way back. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. With the help of the 8th, a branch of the US Air Force established in England, Bomber Command sent waves of bombers over the channel. Known as area or terror bombing, the strategy targeted entire cities and towns. The manpower and machines of the American Air Force were vital to Allied success in Europe. And one of the most important contributions came from the B-17 Flying Fortress. The four-engine heavy bomber was originally designed to protect the continental United States, but saw its first war service with the RAF in 1941. The B-17 came into its own when American pilots flew it on the daylight bombing missions that complemented the RAF's nighttime raids and prepared the ground for Operation Overlord, the Allies' European ground offensive. The 
highly classified Norden bombsite was installed in the B-17 in an attempt to improve the accuracy of high-altitude bombing. The Norden was so top secret that bomber crews were instructed to protect the bombsite with their lives. After each successful mission, the bombardier was required to lodge the Norden at a secure facility on the airbase. Gazette brings you pictures of the huge American Boeing flying fortresses in their first operational attack on the enemy. Participating in a massive daylight bombing raid, these formidable aircraft and their specially trained RAF crews make flying history as they prepare to make the first stratosphere bombing attack in actual warfare. Closed in high altitude flying kit, they're about to ascend into the rarefied atmosphere where the human frame is subjected to a tremendous strain. Between six and seven miles above the Earth's surface, the thermometer falls to 56 degrees below zero, and the men, as well as the machines, have to be supercharged. Special oxygen breathing apparatus enables them to counteract the low pressure in the realms where no man could breathe. Four 1,200 horsepower motors carry the fortress away on its mission, heading for a fantastic height over its target. A second bomb-laden monster takes off, and the stratosphere adventure has begun. Out of sight and hearing, the scream of their bombs will be the only sound that will disclose their presence. After their journey into the regions of frost and ice, the fortresses return to summer heat after leading the way in one of the most destructive raids carried out on Brest. We have every reason to be proud of these supermen of Bomber Command. The morning of the 6th of June, they struck at the European continent. The B-17 dropped 650,000 tons of bombs during World War II, more than any other American aircraft, and took out 11 German U-boats. But the American Air Force sustained heavy losses against the Luftwaffe until the introduction of long-range fighter escorts. As the most produced U.S. military aircraft, the B-24 Liberator heavy bomber contains similar armament to the B-17, but was faster with a longer range. However, the four-engine bomber was made of a lighter weight material, and with fuel tanks in its upper fuselage, it was more vulnerable to attack. Liberators were particularly effective in the Battle of the Atlantic, where they provided air cover for convoys and hunted down U-boats. They were also used in the Pacific, where they replaced the shorter range B-17. Evermore and more liberating eagles take to the air, till the global skies are darkened by their mighty wings. With so much of World War II played out across the oceans of the world, flying boats were also used as bombers. The Americans had the PBY Catalina, the Germans the Dornier DO-22. The RAF depended on the short SE-5 Sunderland, a patrol bomber that stalked the seas in search of German submarines. The multi-purpose aircraft could be used for rescues and reconnaissance, although it could only take off and land from sheltered coastal waters. Each dawn, from Britain's air bases, the giant flying boats of the RAF Coastal Command take off. They're flying battleships that keep the air as the Navy keeps the sea. Often they spend whole days out of sight of land, 
Would you like to take the air with them? With the first light of day, we're roaring out to sea above the guarded harbour mouth. Upon locating a U-boat, often with the assistance of radar, the Sunderland would try to drop its depth charges before the enemy submerged. These bombs would explode about 25 to 30 feet underwater and proved very effective. The first aircraft to sink a submarine without assistance was an Australian-operated Sunderland. And when we reach the convoy, we find that three ships have lost their way. Germany introduced a METOX radar warning system in an attempt to evade discovery, and for a time the Sunderland's kill rate was reduced. However, when centimetric radar was introduced in 1943, METOX stopped being effective. Already the RAF have flown millions of miles on coastal patrol. They are the watchtowers of Britain's ships at sea. Japanese bombers included the Nakajima B-5N torpedo bomber and Aichi D-3A dive bomber used at Pearl Harbor. The aircraft flew from six carriers with the torpedo bombers concentrating on taking out battleships in the first phase of the attack and the dive bombers targeting the air bases. After kamikaze raids, Japanese pilots used the aircraft themselves as bombs. Outclassed by US airplanes, the Japanese formed a special suicide attack unit using Mitsubishi A6M Zero fighters that were loaded with bombs and deliberately crashed into battleships. But with the United States boasting far superior air and land power, it was a losing battle. In the final year of the war, American B-29s rained firebombs on Tokyo, killing more than 100,000 people. The B-29 Super Fortress was a vital component in America's victory over Japan. The four-engined heavy bomber had a range of 3,250 nautical miles and featured a pressurized cabin and remote-controlled machine gun turrets. Capable of carrying up to 20,000 pounds of standard bombs, it could be modified to transport two 22,000-pound earthquake bombs. But it was for dropping just one type of bomb that the Super Fortress gained infamy. On the 6th of August, 1945, Colonel Paul Tibbets flew a B-29 known as Enola Gay to the Japanese city of Hiroshima, where he dropped Little Boy, the first atomic bomb to be used as a weapon. When Little Boy detonated, it exploded with a force equivalent to between 13 and 16 kilotons of TNT, killing 140,000 people. Three days later, a B-29 bomber known as Boxcar dropped a second nuclear bomb over Nagasaki, effectively ending the war. The B-29 next saw active service in the Korean War as the Americans fought Soviet-equipped North Korea. Well armed and equipped, they moved steadily forward toward the Manchurian border under an air cover that hammered incessantly at North Korean supply lines and industrial centers. History may well record that air power spelled the difference between victory and defeat in the opening phases of the struggle. The USSR used the three B-29s it acquired during World War II to create its own version of the heavy bomber, the Tupolev Tu-4 Bull. But with German rocket and jet engine engineers moving to America after the war, it was jet technology that was set to take center stage in aeronautics. In 
Inside a B-29, one day in 1953, Captain Charles Yeager, first man to break through the sound barrier, slid into a rocket-powered XS-1 snuggled against the mother plane. Dropping away under its own power, the skyrocket is soon plunging earthward at almost 1,400 miles an hour, twice the speed of sound, a world record. Refueled four times in flight, a B-50 has circled the globe non-stop. The Azores were first, Saudi Arabia next, and the Philippines third. A final refueling over Hawaii, then home again to Fort Worth. The U.S.'s prototype jet bombers of the mid-1940s had come to naught. But as the Cold War intensified, long-range jet bombers, capable of delivering strategic nuclear strikes, became an integral component of military infrastructure. Yes, we have come far since the Wright brothers' first flight at Kitty Hawk. Yet the future holds still many new challenges. The offensive weapons of tomorrow are here today. Supersonic. Super destructive. Seemingly unresistible. Heavy missile carriers and new supersonic fighters surprised the half million onlookers at Toshino Airfield. In manned aircraft, Russia is perhaps ahead of anything in the West. Khrushchev may bluff sometimes, not every time. The scope can recall any previous phase of the situation from the computer's memory. By analyzing the past, SAGE can project into the future. The computer can furnish information on the countermeasures available so that the officer in charge can make his choice as to when and where to fight. Once he has selected a plan of counterattack, the computer guides interceptors and missiles to the enemy. Here is protection too. The protection which comes with the possession of weapons of retaliation. Just as our defensive powers had been advancing, so have our instruments of attack. In the US, the first pure jet strategic bomber entered service in 1952. The swept-wing B-47 Stratojet was equipped with six jet engines, retractable bicycle-style main landing gear, and carried a three-man crew. It used rocket assist on takeoff and a chute to slow it down on landing. As medium bombers with a range of 3,500 miles, B-47s were stationed at American bases in the UK, Spain, Morocco, Guam and Alaska and formed the front line of America's nuclear deterrent strategy. On the other side of the Iron Curtain, the development of the powerful Mikulin AM-3 turbojet engine enabled the Soviets to build a comparable strategic bomber to the B-47, the Tupolev Tu-16 Badger. Capable of carrying both nuclear and conventional weapons, the Badger went into service across the communist world, and the Chinese version remains in the air today. An all-metal aircraft, the Tu-16 had steerable nose gear, and the main gear retracted backwards into their wing pods and flipped over to stow. The pilot could also release a chute on landing to reduce roll. The weapons bay could carry either nuclear or conventional weapons, up to a 19,850-pound bomb, although the bomber generally carried a range of smaller munitions. The Badger served in the front line of the Soviet nuclear deterrence strategy until intercontinental ballistic missiles became available in the early 1960s. But of all the strategic bombers, none has come close to the B-52 Stratofortress.
Developed to carry nuclear weapons in Cold War deterrence missions, it was the B-52's conventional abilities that saw it become an integral part of the US war machine. Eight turbojet engines power this giant of the skies, which boasts a wingspan of 185 feet and can carry more than 60,000 pounds of armaments. Not to be left behind, the Soviets built the Myasyshev M4 Bison as an answer to the Super Fortress. But the first prototypes of the long-range bomber proved a disappointment. It was unable to fly from the Soviet Union to the United States and back in one hop. A later variation of the Bison gained a longer range with the removal of five original gun barbettes, which lightened its load and it was able to reach American waters but the bomber was unable to reach key cities on the American continent. The Tupolev Tu-95 Bear was better placed to serve as a strategic bomber. The Bear is the only bomber to use turboprop engines, which give it a range and endurance greater than comparable jets at just slightly slower speeds. The Tu-95 became well known to American fighters as it prowled the edges of NATO airspace on surveillance missions. It was also the aircraft that dropped the Tsar Bomba hydrogen bomb in 1961, the most powerful atomic weapon ever test detonated. The following year, the USSR put the Tu-22 Blinder into service. Its medium bomber variant could reach supersonic speeds and cruise at high subsonic speeds. The Blinder carried up to 9,000 kilograms of bombs, including various free-fall nuclear weapons. I'm Wing Commander Frank, the commanding officer of 83 Squadron and the captain of a Vulcan. The Vulcan is a delightful aeroplane. It combines the greatest ease of handling with a very high performance and extremely high reliability. As one of the select countries to join the nuclear club, the United Kingdom was keen to develop its own strategic nuclear bomber. In 1952, the first Avro Vulcan took to the skies in test flights. The Delta Wing subsonic bomber went into service four years later, carrying Britain's first nuclear bomb, the Blue Danube. Vulcans carried Red Snow, Britain's first thermonuclear weapon, as well as American thermonuclear bombs under NATO agreements. The Vulcan could also be armed with conventional weaponry and played an important role in Britain's conflict with Argentina over the Falkland Islands in 1982. The jets bombed airfields and radar installations, refueling in mid-air using Victor aircraft and setting the record for the world's longest distance raids. Also in the British arsenal was the Handley Page Victor HP-80. Its distinctive crescent wing was designed by German aerodynamicist Dr. Gustav Lachmann and Godfrey Lee of the Handley Page Aviation Company. The Victor was fitted with four Armstrong Sidley Sapphire engines and had a larger bomb bay than its bomber counterparts. In 1956, test pilot Johnny Allen inadvertently broke the sound barrier when he dipped the nose and achieved Mach 1.1. Witnesses heard a sonic boom, and the Victor became the largest aircraft to reach the speed of sound at that time. While the British bombers cruised the world in the hope of averting conflict, the French were fighting a hot war in Indochina. China, the Reds take a hammering. General Delanar's French theater commander sees his flyers blast the enemy with napalm bombs. With French and loyal Vietnam forces disorganized after the death of the dynamic General Delatra, the Reds made substantial penetrations into Allied territory. But now counterattacks have pushed the enemy back. 
French Dakotas, Ju-52s and B-26s bombed Vietnam's communist forces in the years before America intervened. A decade later, the United States entered the war in Vietnam on the side of the anti-communist South. It was in this conflict that the B-52 came into its own. Although designed primarily as a carrier of nuclear weapons, the Stratofortress performed admirably as a conventional bomber. When the USA escalated its commitment in 1964, 74 B-52F bombers were fitted with external racks that could hold 24 750-pound bombs. The aircraft took part in Operation Rolling Thunder, a systemic bombing campaign targeting North Vietnam's industry and infrastructure. Several B-52D bombers were modified to carry 60,000 pounds of explosives, enabling them to undertake carpet bombing campaigns. Whole villages and large swathes of jungle were laid waste with this tactic, and the weapons used included highly flammable napalm bombs. The next advance on the B-52 was the B-1 Lancer. This strategic bomber had its first flight in 1974, entered service 12 years later, and remains a key component of American military strategy. It's also the last remaining variable sweep wing aircraft in the US military. Known as the Bone, allegedly because a reporter left the hyphen out of the name B-1, the bomber is capable of supersonic flight at altitude, but its primary role is as a subsonic low-level penetrator with stealth features and the capacity to carry nuclear cruise missiles. Its swing-wing design and four General Electric F-101 GE-102 augmented turbofan engines give the aeroplane exceptional range, speed and flexibility. Through the use of radar and inertial navigation equipment, its crews can navigate around the world, update mission profiles and target coordinates in flight. Despite its advanced avionics and futuristic design, the B-1 has faced challenges due to the lack of spare parts and maintenance problems. Nevertheless, 66 remain in active service. The Soviets introduced their own swing-wing bomber in 1972, the Tu-22-26 Backfire. The long-range strategic and maritime strike bomber can fly at supersonic speeds and is still used by Russian forces. Unlike earlier Tupolev bombers, the Backfire carried its landing gear in the wing glove rather than large pods. On its release, the bomber's range gave the Americans cause for concern, as it could penetrate US airspace if it refueled in the air, was launched from nearby territory, or was flying a one-way mission. Backfires were used to drop conventional bombs during the Soviet war on Afghanistan in the early 1980s, and were deployed by Russian forces against Chechen fighters in 1995. The most advanced bomber in the United States military is the Northrop Grumman B-2 Spirit, also known fondly as Lamb Chop. Costing close to a billion dollars per aeroplane, the Americans scaled back their commitment when the true cost became known and ordered just 21 of the stealth bombers. But even a small fleet of these unique aircraft brings benefits. The Spirit's stealth ability allows it to penetrate enemy airspace undetected and unload its payload of either conventional or nuclear weapons. And although its expense and abilities dwarf other American bombers, the Spirit carries just two pilots, an aircraft commander and a mission commander. Its systems are highly automated, allowing the pilots rest breaks while flying. The B-2 range is so great that a bomber carrying conventional weapons could cover the world with just one refueling. From grenades dropped by hand over the side of a biplane to the computerized stealth weapons systems launching laser-guided smart bombs, the tactical and strategic bomber has evolved in capabilities undreamt of by the early aviation pioneers. Today, unmanned Predator aircraft roam the skies in far-off lands armed with Maverick air-to-ground missiles. From an air-conditioned office halfway around the world, an operator can fly these silent machines to their target, lock on with a laser beam, and release their missiles, destroying that target. 
few can guess what the future holds for these machines of war. <laughs>